Hello and welcome to the eOrganic webinar on the impact of organic grain farming methods on climate change by Michelle Cavagelli. My name is Alice Formiga and I'm the webinar coordinator for eOrganic. eOrganic is the Organic Agriculture Community of Practice with eExtension. We're a community of cooperative extension service personnel, researchers, ag professionals, organic certifiers, and practitioners. You can find all of our recorded webinars, information about upcoming webinars, as well as articles and videos on organic farming on our website at extension.org slash organic underscore production. This is the first webinar in this winter's climate change webinar series. Our second climate change webinar will be taking place this coming Monday, so if you'd like to register for that, you can also find it on our website under upcoming webinars. In this webinar, Dr. Cavagelli will discuss how agriculture contributes to climate change and how organic farming might be able to help mitigate these effects. I'd like to briefly introduce our speaker. Michelle Cavagelli is a soil scientist in the USDA Agricultural Research Service Sustainable Agricultural Systems Lab in Beltsville, Maryland. He's been working in organic and sustainable agriculture since 1985. After his 45-minute presentation, you will have the chance to ask him questions. If you have a question, you can simply type it into the question box on your screen and hit return. If you can't see the question box, click the small plus sign next to the word question on your control panel to open it up. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for during the 30-minute question period following the presentation. Well, now that we've introduced the presentation, we'd like to know a little bit about who you are. So we're going to launch a 30-second poll to get an idea of who's in our audience today. Once that's finished, I'll hand things over to Michelle. So we'll just have this poll up for about 30 seconds or so, and then we'll take it off. OK, and uh, so the results will be displayed. All right, and now I'm going to hand things over to you, Michelle. OK. Okay, most people are other, huh? <laughs> Hello, everybody. Uh, I need to make sure I know how to move. Okay, there. Thanks, Alice. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hi, my name is Michelle Cavagelli, as Alice mentioned, and I'm going to talk today about the impact of organic grain farming on climate change. Uh, I just want to clarify, I'm not talking about the opposite. I'm not talking about the impact of climate change on farming. <clears throat> It's a bigger topic. However, the research I'm presenting is uh, a part of this project called GraceNet, uh, Greenhouse Gas Reduction Through Agricultural Carbon Enhancement. And this is a network of about 32 sites uh, within the USDA ARS, and that is USDA Agricultural Research Service. So first, uh, here's what I'm going to be talking about. I'll talk in general kind of about uh, as a means of introduction about global warming and greenhouse gases. And then I'll talk about how agriculture impacts these greenhouse gases. And then I'm going to talk about global warming potential, which is a way of measuring the impact of agriculture on greenhouse gases. And then I will present a case study where we did this, where we measured global warming potential in both organic and conventional cropping systems in Maryland. You all probably are very familiar with the concept of global warming. This is evidence from the IPCC, the International Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, showing evidence of the changing temperature of the planet. This line that I've drawn at the zero on the y-axis of each of these graphs indicates the average of each of the uh, measurements here between 1961 and 1990. So you'll see that the average from 1961 to 1990, which is about where my arrow is going back and forth, hits that line. So you notice that the temperatures are going up. You'll notice that the global average sea level is increasing. And in this case, the bottom line here, the uh, bottom graph here, that the snow cover in the northern hemisphere is decreasing, all evidence of warming of the planet. Why is this happening? You might have seen these graphs as well. These are graphs also from the IPCC showing the concentration of carbon dioxide, methane, and nitrous oxide in the atmosphere. And at the bottom here of the graph, 
Uh, I don't know if you can see that, but this is time since 2005. So this is 5,000 years be before 2005. Pretty dramatic patterns where for many years the, the uh, concentration of these gases was relatively stable and then has increased dramatically. If you look at these little insets, you can see that in the last 100 years, especially, that there's been quite a uh, dramatic increase in each of these three gases. These are called biogenic greenhouse gases, which means that they're produced by biological organisms. So big changes in the atmosphere over the last uh, 100 years, and that's what's uh, contributing to the change in climate. OK. Um, to be able to compare the effect of these different gases all together in one uh, fell swoop, we can express each of these gases in CO2 equivalents. So N2O, for example, which is nitrous oxide, is 298 times as powerful on a weight basis as CO2 so that the carbon dioxide equivalent of N2O is 298. The carbon dioxide equivalent of methane is 25. And this all assumes a carbon dioxide equivalent for carbon dioxide of just one. That's going to become relevant in the next graph, for instance, where the, again, this is from the IPCC. Um, if you look on the y-axis here, this is gigatons of CO2 equivalents per year. So this, uh, these CO2 equivalents allow you to put everything on the same axis. And there's a couple of things to see on this graph. One is that from 1970 to 2004, for example, the uh, amount of of, of greenhouse gases we're putting into the atmosphere is increasing. And if you look at the, this bar graph, for example, for 2004, you'll see that this pink bar indicates the amount that, of CO2 equivalents that are from CO2, specifically from fossil fuel uses. So fossil fuel is definitely the primary source of greenhouse gases. This next yellow bar is CO2 from deforestation, decay, and peat. This is mostly then from plant and soils. CO2 released from those uh, with land use change activities. The next uh, bluish colored bar there is uh, methane, most uh, from agriculture, waste, and energy. And finally, the top purple bar is nitrous oxide, or N2O. If we look at the same data uh, as a pie chart, you'll see again that CO2 from fossil fuel use is the dominant, uh, this is the dominant source of greenhouse gases. Um, then forestation, deforestation, methane, and nitrous oxide. So in this case, nitrous oxide represents about 8% of the global warming potential of these three green, of all greenhouse gases. This next pie chart here shows how those uh, greenhouse gases are distributed among various um, uh, industries. Agriculture here represents 13.5% of greenhouse gases. This, however, does not, rep does not include fossil fuel used in agriculture. So this is the amount of greenhouse gases attributable to agriculture that comes from uh, whether it's loss of CO2, uh, soil carbon in soil, or whether it's uh, nitrous oxide production, or methane from uh, cows, for instance. OK, so that gives you kind of an overall picture of uh, the greenhouse gases status at the time, at this time. If we look more closely at the contribution of agriculture to these different greenhouse gases, <clears throat> and this again is from the IPCC in 2007, agricultural lands occupy about 40 to 50 percent of the Earth's land surface, so that includes cropland, managed grasslands, permanent crops. For CO2, the proportion of CO2 that's attributable to agriculture is very small. It's less than 1% of total greenhouse gas emissions. For methane and N2O, agriculture is the dominant source, or close to the dominant source of these two gases. And these two gases, methane and N2O, are increasing around 17% at this point. Uh, you'll notice there'll be a talk on Monday, if any of you are going uh, listening to that webinar, that uh, those, those speakers will focus on the contribution in the U.S. These numbers are for the globe here. 
and the numbers presented for the U.S. will be slightly different in case you're, uh, you're wondering about that. Okay, I want to show you kind of quickly here the carbon cycle, a schematic diagram of a simplified carbon cycle. And this is on a global basis. So the question, the, the questions I want to answer with this graph, or this diagram, are where is carbon on the planet, and why is the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere increasing? This is how much uh, how much carbon is in the atmosphere. Is 750 gigatons. A gigaton is 10 to the ninth tons. And the amount in the atmosphere. It's just like a bank account, in a sense, in that the size of the amount of CO2 in that bank account, it is dependent on how many inputs you make, which are represented by these lead arrows, and how much is being taken out of that bank account. And the primary way that CO2 is taken out of that bank account is through photosynthesis by plants and also by uh, photosynthetic organisms in the ocean. And there's also the ocean absorbs CO2. The fact that this is increasing means that we are putting more CO2 via these lead arrows into the atmosphere, putting it in faster than can be taken out by photosynthesis and by um, absorption into the ocean. So why is that increasing? And you saw in the graph earlier that it's increasing. It's been increasing, especially in the last 100 years or so. And that's largely because of this pool of carbon that exists on the planet. And that is fossil fuels, oil, gas, and coal that prior to the Industrial Revolution really didn't leave the uh, inside of the planet. We've taken them out, and we've burned them. And then when we burn them, we release CO2. At the same time, we've also deforested a lot of land, and we've removed the carbon that's been in the plants, as well as some of the carbon that's been in the soil, that's been stored in the soil. You'll notice down here that there's a big pool of carbon in the soil as well. In fact, that pool is twice as big as the atmospheric pool. By far, the largest pool of carbon is the ocean. You'll notice on this diagram. Um, so one thing I want to emphasize with this graph is that CO2 can be both introduced to the atmosphere, but it can also be removed. And those two processes are going on constantly. OK. This is a very busy diagram. I don't want to spend much time on the details of it. It is the nitrogen cycle. The only point I want to make here is that this is nitrous oxide, N2O. You'll notice that there's arrows pointing towards it, but not away from it. The point of that is that nitrous oxide is produced in soils but it is not, there's not a strong sink for it. In other words, once it's in the atmosphere, it tends to stay for quite a long time. In fact, one of the ways that it disappears is by um, helping catalyze the breakdown of stratospheric ozone, which is another uh, uh, side effect of, of N2O, or another effect of N2O in the atmosphere. OK. So let's get back to agriculture and mitigating greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, a lot of people have come up with a number of schemes of trying to get these, CO, these uh, greenhouse gas concentrations in the atmosphere reduced. There's a lot of engineering approaches to trying to do that. And in essence, none of those are really proven on a large, on a large scale that will make a difference in, in, in global concentrations of these greenhouse gases. However, agriculture could contribute to, as a mitigation option, using existing technologies and these technologies can be implemented immediately. This includes things like reducing tillage, increasing carbon inputs to soil, improving nitrogen use efficiency, and improving livestock management. These first two, reducing tillage and increasing carbon inputs to soil, largely address the CO2 piece of the greenhouse gases. Improving nitrogen use efficiency addresses nitrous oxide, and improving livestock management addresses methane primarily. Today, by the way, I will only be speaking about cropland management. This is a graph, again, from the IPCC showing different mitigation options within agriculture. Those are shown here on the x-axis. I will not be talking about animal use. I will not talk about grazing land management and all these other aspects here. So I'll be focusing on cropland management. And you'll notice that 
what the IPCC here has estimated is that within cropland management, the most benefit, this lead ball, the most benefit we can get from agricultural management options is to put, take CO2 out of the atmosphere and store it in the soil. So these lead bars on all these, on all these lead bars on this graph represent carbon sequestration. So carbon sequestration is the removal of CO2 from the atmosphere via photosynthesis and then incorporating that carbon that plants have made into an organic carbon source into the soil and keeping it there. That's carbon sequestration. This blue section of the ball here represents nitrous oxide and it indicates that there's also some mitigation that could occur by reducing nitrous oxide emissions from soils. Okay. So if you want to compare then how one, man, one method of farming compares with another method of farming to look at the impact on global warming, one way to do that is by calculating what is called the global warming potential. So what is that? The global warming potential, or GWP, is the balance between the net exchange of CO2, N2O, and methane that results from on-farm practices and the production and transport of inputs. So in other words, it's just a accounting for the amount of C net CO2 release, N2O release, and methane release from the, 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 the management practices that occur during, during forming or doing the practices that you're comparing. I hope that was clear. GWP then can be greater than zero and without indicators that the activity contributes to global climate change or it increases the, uh, the greenhouse gases, its net contributor to greenhouse gas in the atmosphere. Or GWP can be less than zero, meaning that the activity mitigates global climate change or that you're pulling greenhouse gases a net pulling of greenhouse gases out of the atmosphere or reducing the amount going into the atmosphere. Agriculture being a biological process and for uh, various reasons it has the potential to have a GWP that is less than zero. In other words, can actually mitigate climate change. So now I'm going to walk you through how this is calculated and this will become a little more technical. This is now an introduction to the methods that we used here in Maryland to assess the global warming potential of our organic and conventional systems within a long-term research project. So if you look at the top line here, global warming potential equals the change in soil carbon. So if you are accumulating carbon, this would be a negative value actually plus the N2O flux, how much N2O is coming out of your soil, plus methane flux, same thing, how much is coming out or, or being absorbed, and then energy use. Energy use is uh, in CO2 equivalents. In fact, all of these, all of these, um, all of these factors that we're adding here are in the unit of CO2 equivalents, which we talked about, I mentioned a little bit earlier. In this case, for soil carbon, when we measure soil carbon, we need to multiply by this factor to get CO2 equivalents. That's just accounting for the fact that CO2 has two oxygen molecules. Soil carbon doesn't have those oxygen molecules. Nitrous oxide, as I mentioned, is 298 times. I forgot to update this. The IPCC has updated this to 298 instead of 296, but it's a fairly close number there. Almost 300 times as powerful a, a, a chemical as CO2 and methane multiplied by 25. Again, I have not updated that, but it's about the same, in the same ballpark. For energy use, um, what we need to do is to look at how much CO2 is produced in making the products we're using on farm as well as how much CO2 is released by burning fossil fuels to, say, run a tractor. And there are tables that can be used where engineers have looked at some of those values to compile that information. Okay, so let's look a little more closer at changes in soil carbon. What do we know about cropping system impacts in general? The literature generally shows that no-till has more soil carbon than chisel-till. So that no-till, if you look just at soil 
changes in soil carbon would indicate a, a, a lower global warming potential than a conventionally tilled system. There are some cases where that, there are some exceptions to this kind of generalized uh, rule here, but I don't want to get into those right now. However, the carbon that's, long, that's uh, stored in a no-till soil is stored at the surface of the soil, and because of that, that carbon can be lost after some tillage, and there's some evidence that the carbon stored in no-till soils is stored only if you do continuous no-till. And so the, the point I'm trying to make there is that the carbon in a no-till soil is susceptible to loss following tillage. There's not that much data on organic systems. The data that are out, are out there indicate that organic systems might have higher soil carbon than conventional systems. But there's very few data comparing organic systems and no-till systems, for example. Oh, there, there's our soil organic metal. OK, so the next item in our equation is N2O flux. Again, what I want to emphasize is that gains in soil carbon can be offset by N2O emissions. In other words, if you emit, if you are able to, to sequester, let's say, 298 grams or pounds of CO2, but in doing that, you lose one gram or pound of N2O, you essentially haven't done anything in terms of global warming potential because the gain you've made in, in sequestering CO2 has been lost with just one unit of N2O. The literature shows that no-till has either equal or greater N2O emissions than chisel till, but this will vary by soil type, so it can be complicated. In terms of organic, there are some indications that organic has similar N2O emissions as conventional systems. But there's also a number of examples of organic having lower N2O emissions than conventional. And all these citations, however, are from Europe. So there's not that much data from the United States. There's also very few data on soil N2O emissions from cropping systems in the southeast US, which is where the study site that I'll be talking about later is uh, situated. In terms of methane flux, I mentioned a little bit earlier that a lot of the methane is due to uh, ruminant. And it turns out that there's not much of an impact on co of cropping systems on methane fluxes from soil. So what that means is we can simplify this equation when we're looking just at cropping systems. We can call GWP, global warming potential, is the change in soil carbon plus N2O flux plus energy use. So we need to plug in three different uh, pieces of information to calculate global warming potential of cropping systems. So finally, the last component then is energy use. And the literature shows in general that no-till has lower uh, energy use than, chis than conventional till. And that's expected because we're doing less tillage. We're increasing the amount of herbicides used in no-till compared to conventional till. But in general, the balance leads to less energy use in no-till. For organic compared to chisel, uh, conventional till, in organic or in any kind of in organic, we're not using synthetic nitrogen fertilizers. And on average in the US, nitrogen fertilizers are about 30%, represent about 30% of the energy use in agriculture. There's also no pesticides, or essentially no pesticides, especially in field cropping systems such as this. However, there is greater tillage in organic systems contributing to more energy use. In the literature, there's not much information on no-till versus organic in terms of energy use. Oops. So this is, uh, given that kind of background information, what we set out to do here at the uh, Farming Systems Project in Maryland, in Beltsville, Maryland, is to measure the global warming potential of three different cropping systems a no-till cropping system, a chisel-till cropping system, and an organic system. We did that on this long-term project that was established in 1996. Each of these plots, this is a plot here, is one quarter acre in size, or one-tenth of a hectare. And so we use full-size farming equipment for this. These are the five cropping systems that we have at the FSP. 
and I'm going to talk only about three of them, so I'm going to remove those other two for now. I've mentioned no-till. We have a no-till system. We have a chisel till system that is similar to conventional tillage. Uh, it's maybe a little less tillage than uh, a moldboard plow, for example. And then we have an organic system. Each of these systems are actually three-year rotations in that the first year is corn, followed by a rye cover crop. Second year, we have soybeans. And then we plant a winter cover crop, uh, I'm sorry, a winter wheat crop. And then we follow that in the third year after, after wheat harvest with vetch in the organic system. This is hairy vetch, shown down here, used as a nitrogen source for the following corn. In the two conventional systems, after we, plant, after we harvest the wheat, we plant a double crop soybean. So there's four crops really in three years there, four cash crops, five if you include the rye crop here. In our no-till and chisel-till systems, we side dress nitrogen fertilizer in a band. In our organic systems, we use a moldboard plow, and we also use poultry litter to add additional nitrogen and other nutrients, and we use that poultry litter. We apply it before the corn and also before the wheat. In all our systems, we have all rotation entry points each year. Uh, quickly, for methods, if people are interested in this, to measure the amount of carbon, remember we're trying to measure global warming potential, which is the change in soil carbon plus nit nitrous oxide efflux plus energy use. So to measure soil carbon, what we did is we took three cores per plot down to one meter. This is what the cores look like inside a, a plastic tube. We then split those into different depth increments, 0 to 2.5 centimeters or 0 to 1 inch, 1 to 2 inches, two, uh, what I say, 0 to 1 inch, 1 to 2 inches, 2 to 4 inches, 4 to 10 inches, 10 to about 20, and about 20 to about 40 inches, down to 1 meter. Uh, we analyzed those using dry combustion, which is a traditional way of doing that. For our N2O flux, again, we measured these fluxes in these three systems. In our corn plots, we had two frames per plot. These are frames that we insert into the soil that uh, has a little gutter there that we fill with water, and then we put this lid on top of that, and then we measure the amount of gas coming out of there by using a needle and syringe inserted through this uh, sampling port. We put those samples into these vials here. We bring those back into the vial, I mean into the lab, analyze them on a gas chromatograph, and then um, this is just an indication of what the data look like, if anybody's interested in that. <clears throat> we do this all year long. Um, we did it in 2005, 2006, 2007, 2008. We skipped 2009, but we measured in 2010 again. And we take these samples essentially every time after a rainfall. And so some years we get more, and some years we get less actual sampling events per year. To look at our energy consumption, we just used the, um, uh, I can't see this on my screen, but down below this line here, there's the citations of the, the, the where, we, where we got the numbers to make these calculations. Essentially, and I'm just showing this for corn for 2008, this is the machinery component of energy use. So we made a list of all the different operations that we use in these systems. And from the literature, we got these values of kilograms carbon equivalents per hectare per pass. So for a moldboard plow, we have a, a value of 20 as a CE carbon equivalent value. And we use that piece of equipment once in the organic system. So we multiply 1 times 20 and et cetera for all these operations such that then we can calculate how much here in the total, how much energy in carbon equivalents in this case, and then we converted these carbon equivalents to CO2 equivalents. And you can basically see here, though, that in our organic system, we're using more energy and therefore emitting more CO2 than in our chisel-till system, and that even more so than in our no-till system. OK, that's just to give you an idea of how we do these calculations. So now I'm going to show you the results from our, these, these measurements and estimates. 
This is what we found for soil carbon down to one meter depth in our no-till system. And this is in the units on megagrams carbon per hectare. That's not supposed to be hectare squared. I, I made a mistake there, just per hectare. Uh, but even if you don't look at the units, you can see that um, between our no-till and our chisel till, there's really no statistically significant difference in the amount of carbon down to one meter. But in our organic system, we have a significantly more, we have significantly more carbon down to a meter than we do in our two conventional systems. So to use this information in calculating global warming potential, we need to calculate how much of a change each of these numbers represents from the beginning of the experiment. We measured these values in 2006, which is 11 years after the beginning of the experiment. And what we assumed is that the no-till had not changed, because the site where the experiment was placed had been in no-till for at least 11 years prior to the beginning of the experiment. And that's why we see a zero here. So there's no change in soil carbon. Um, then if we look at the chisel till, we see that this number has decreased from what we assume was the beginning number. And so we have a net decrease in soil carbon, a negative number, meaning a decrease in soil carbon. Whereas in the organic system, we show an uh, increase in soil carbon. And it's a substantial increase. OK, so those three numbers are then statistically different from each other. OK, so let's go down to the Let's look down into the soil a little bit. Where is that carbon? This is the depth on this axis here, the soil depth. It's the midpoint of those sample increments I showed earlier. Then this over here, the x-axis, is the total soil carbon. And we see a typical pattern where no-till shows more carbon at the soil surface than the other two systems. But as we go down in soil depth, we see that no-till has about the same amount of carbon as the other three, the other two systems. Our chisel till system has the least amount of carbon in the surface layers and also still has lower carbon than the organic system at all these at these four uh, surface layers. So while organic systems have less carbon at the very surface compared to no till in this experiment, they have more, it has more than in the chisel till system. OK, what are our results for nitrous oxide? And here I'm just showing the data from the corn plots, because we've measured the corn. We measured the N2O in the corn plots uh, multiple years, 2005, 6, 7, 8, and 2010. Of course, 2010 is not done, so this is not a complete data set yet. But we'll, what do we see? We see that no-till, chisel-till, and the three are organic show no difference, statistically speaking, in terms of N2O emissions in 2005. In 2006, we see that our two conventional systems have about twice as much, or up to twice as much, I should say, N2O emissions as the organic system. And this difference was statistically significant. However, in 2007, you'll see that our corn and our organic system had slightly higher N2O emissions than the two, or than the chisel till system and not statistically different than our no-till system. So we're seeing some small differences. By the way, 2007 was a very dry year, and N2O is produced during wet soil conditions in general. And that's why these numbers are quite a bit lower than our numbers in the previous years. In 2008 and 2010, we saw no significant differences between the three different systems. And finally, when we add up the, C the N2O emissions from these five years in corn in these three systems, we see a slightly greater N2O emissions in our no-till system compared to our organic system. But this was only significant at the 0.1 level. What that means is that we're only 90% certain of that. And as scientists, we like to see 95% certainty. In other words, we like to see 0.05 as our significance level. So really nothing very dramatic in terms of N differences in N2O emissions in these systems. However, if we look at the amount of N2O produced, and here we do just the nitrogen portion of the N2O, if we look at the amount of N2O produced divided by the total nitrogen inputs, and for corn, this would be in the conventional systems, would be fertilizer. 
and the nitrogen from the, succeed, the preceding soybean uh, crop. And in the organic system, it would be the um, nitrogen from the vetch as well as from the manure. What we see is that the proportion of N2O released, the proportion of total N inputs released as N2O in the organic system is lower than in the two conventional systems. This to me is interesting and it kind of it indicates that maybe there's something different going on in the organic system soil such that we're getting less of the nitrogen we apply emitted as N2O. And this could be because of a difference in carbon to nitrate ratio in the soil. We're not, we don't know for sure yet. That's something we're investigating further. Uh, but it does indicate something to look at more closely. Okay, so that's N2O results, and that's just for our corn plots. In 2008, we were able to measure the N2O emissions not just in the corn plots, but also in the uh, soybean and wheat plots in these three systems, and that's what I'm going to show you in the next uh, graph uh, table. Uh, this is, again, the same data for the corn here. And then if we look at soybeans, we found no significant differences in soybeans in these three systems, but we did find quite a bit more N2O being emitted during the wheat phase of the rotation for the three-year organic system than we did in these two conventional systems. When we looked at the average for this full rotation, what that meant is that our organic system was, put, was emitting more N2O than our no-till system uh, in uh, 2008. And again, this is one year of data only. We haven't summarized our 2010 data for these uh, other crops yet. Okay, so what did we see in terms of energy use? And here I'm just showing the, the corn data to identify, to sh highlight the differences in these different categories of energy use. And in terms of machinery, so this is basically the uh, fossil fuel used in, uh, in uh, managing the plots using uh, tractors. And you would expect the, that the, the CO2 equivalents from machinery in the no-till would be lower than in the, in the chisel till here. And you also expect that to be lower than in the organic system, which is what we found. So we're getting more and more CO2 emitted in our organic systems because of more passes in the field. However, then when we look at nutrients, so this is for corn includes nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium, we see an enormous CO2 cost, mostly from that nitrogen, but also from phosphorus and potassium in both of our systems. And we added, we tended to add about the same amount of uh, fertilizer in those systems. And you'll notice that there's a much lower value here for the organic system. If you remember, we grew our own nitrogen by having a legume cover crop, hairy vetch. And we also, but we also used poultry litter. And what I've done here is used a very conservative estimate, assuming that the poultry litter is produced within a kilometer of the farm. If we change that distance, this number will go up relatively quickly. In fact, if we transport a little more than 100 kilometers, then this value will look similar to these values over here. So the amount of the distance that you transport your poultry litter is an enormous factor in affecting the amount of CO2 emitted in any system that uses a manure as a uh, source of nutrients. In terms of seed costs, we're about the same amount of CO2 emitted. But then in terms of herbicides, of course, our conventional systems use herbicides, so they have some CO2 cost to that. Our organic system, we don't use any herbicides. So then when we total those numbers, we'll, we see that there's a lot more CO2 emitted in the, in the uh, conventional systems than in the organic system for corn production. When we look then at the, the all three crops in the full rotation, and the amount of CO2 equivalents emitted from energy use. If we add up those numbers, or take the average of those numbers, we find that we still have about twice as much, or a little more than twice as much, CO2 emitted through energy use in the conventional systems than in the organic system. Okay, so this is the final data slide, or one of the final data slides, showing what our final calculations are. 
So here's our three components of our global warming potential. Change in soil carbon, N2O emissions, and this is what I did is I just used the 2008 data because that's the only year we have corn, soybean, and wheat, and then energy, uh, CO2 emitted from energy use. And we've added those up to calculate global warming potential over here. And what do we see? Chisel till has the highest global warming potential. And it has higher global warming potential than the no-till. And this is largely due to this change difference in carb soil carbon. Because N2O and energy use are very similar. But what else do we see that? the organic system actually has a negative global warming potential based on the calculations as I've described them. This is driven in part because of this difference in energy use, despite the fact that we have more N2O here, but it's largely driven by this change in soil carbon. Soil carbon is now, uh, now has a negative value because we are accumulating carbon, so for global warming uh, potential purposes, uh, the soil carbon get an increase in soil carbon means a negative value. I hope that's that's clear. Um, seeing the questions uh, real quickly, people are often concerned that yields in organic systems are lower, so we need to factor the yield values into these global warming potential values. What I've shown you so far is based on an area basis. These are the uh, yield data for our three systems. This is the the organic system we've been talking about, and these are the two conventional systems. So we have lower yields in our organic systems. We looked at the yields in corn, soybean, and wheat, came up with a factor, to, an average factor for those, and then divided our global warming potential, which is the same numbers from the previous graph, by that crop yield to determine what is called greenhouse gas intensity. So the number of the kilogram of CO2 equivalents per megagram of grain produced. What do we see? We see that there's no difference between our two conventional systems, but that we still are seeing, first of all, both a net, we're seeing a, a lower value for our organic systems than our two conventional systems, and of course our number is still a negative value. So in other words, we're still, per unit of grain produced, we're still uh, sequestering uh, greenhouse gases whereas in our conventional systems, we're still producing those greenhouse gases. So conclusions are that in our, our, for soil carbon, our organic system had more soil carbon than both our con conventional systems, and that the carbon sequestered at depth in the organic system should be more stable than in the surface of the no-till soils. However, we, so it's important to include diverse cropping systems in long-term ag agricultural research sites such as the one used to make these measurements so that we can fully evaluate soil carbon sequestration options. In terms of N2O, uh, I, I don't want to repeat all, all this complexity that we found, but some years essentially organic has a higher uh, N2O flux than conventional systems, and that can be reversed in different years. What's important is that it's really important to have long-term data sets for N2O because of the interannual variability. I should mention that the high N2O in the wheat in 2008 that I showed uh, might in part be due because we applied additional manure, higher rates of manure that year than we usually do for wheat. And that might be uh, something, that's something we need to look at closer and we need to have some more data to get a better number for that. So in other words, we need additional years for these N2O flux numbers. I also want to point out one thing about the uh, nitrogen in these organic systems that might be something we can generalize to organic systems in other areas. In these three systems, we looked at the nitrogen mineralization potentials. This is the amount of nitrogen that is can become plant available in a year in these systems. This was measured as a soil incubation you'll notice that there's more nitrogen that can be released in the organic systems than in the two conventional systems. This is prior to adding hairy vetch and manure. So this is just the power of the soil after 14 years of management in these systems to release nitrogen. So what does that mean? That means that if we then grow corn on these soils without adding anything that year, but just using the, power, the soil's nitrogen-releasing power, we find that we get 
this is about a hundred equivalent to about 150 bushels per acre of corn, which is 10.2 10.2 megagrams per hectare. We get quite a bit more corn grown on an organic soil than on a conventional soil when they're not fertilized, indicating that, uh, which is what you want in an organic system to build up these uh, nitrogen reserves. But what this also indicates is that we might be able to reduce manure applications in our organic system. So we need to look at this with some reduced uh, manure applications. Because this is this number is without any manure or without any hairy vetch. So we might be able to rely more heavily on our hairy vetch and less on our manure in these systems. That's kind of a side note that I think might be of interest for future discussion. In terms of energy use, then, no-till and chisel-till had quite a bit higher energy use than the three-year organic. However, a caveat, energy use in the three-year organic is strongly controlled by manure transport distance. So that'll vary quite a bit from form to form. and needs to be looked at closely to make a full evaluation of the impact of organic systems on global warming potential compared to more conventional systems. Uh, finally, then global warming potential was highest in the chisel till system, lower in the no till system, and even lower in the three year organic system. And global warming potential was negative in the organic system, despite having high N2O in 2008. Uh, when we factor in the yield differences, we see that the greenhouse gas intensity was similar for chisel till and no till but still greater than the organic system, and organic still had a negative uh, GHGI. These differences among systems are driven primarily by soil carbon and then secondarily by energy use. I just want to recognize that there's a lot of people involved in making these kinds of measurements over the years, and here's a whole bunch of them. Uh, and finally, I have one more slide with uh, further information on the impact of agriculture on greenhouse gases. And that's the end of my talk. Thank you very much, Michelle. Um, now we'll have about 30 minutes to answer your questions. For those of you who missed the beginning of the presentation, um, I wanted to tell you that you can use the question box on your screen to type in questions and then hit return. If the question box is closed, you can click the small plus sign next to the word question on your control panel to open it up. Um, we'll be reading the questions out loud and we'll answer as many as we have time for. I also wanted to let you know, in case you had to leave early, that this webinar will also be posted on the eOrganic website within the coming week. It usually takes about seven days or so, in case you'd like to hear it again or share it with others. If after the webinar you have additional questions that haven't been answered, you can use the online Ask an Expert system on eExtension at eextension.org slash ask. I've displayed the web address on the screen as well as the address of the eOrganic website where the presentation, along with all of our other archived webinar presentations, are archived. So um, I'd also want to mention again that we'll be hosting a second free webinar on climate change this coming Monday at 2 p.m. Eastern time. And you can find information on this and our other upcoming webinars on our website. So I'm going to move on to the question and answer. And we've gotten quite a few questions and comments, um, and so I'll do my best to sort of phrase them as questions. Um, one, um, we've gotten several questions, um, and the sort of the central point, I think, on um, some of them is related to how um, you measured organic systems data and how it was calculated, because there's such great variation in kinds of tillage in organic systems, for example, Organic farmers um, often don't use moldboard plows, and they often use legumes rather than manure for nitrogen fixation. Can you comment on that and why um, yeah. on-farm research wasn't used instead of um, <laughs> plot research? Sure. No, all, all, all are very good questions. There's definitely a huge variety of management techniques and combinations of techniques used in organic systems. and Similar type thing can be said for uh, conventional systems. There's, there's variety in crop rotations. There's variety in how much fertilizer people use. What we did is, in setting up this long-term project, is try to mimic what farmers in this part of the world are doing. 
and so um, we have a group of farmers that we consult with on a regular basis to make sure what we're doing reflects what uh, is being done in the area. And that's right. There's, uh, in terms of the differences in management, um, that's kind of just a given. So that's why I mentioned, that's why I included on the slides what specific management we use in these systems so that the analysis is, yes, certainly specific to what we did here. But what we think we can do is use the same techniques for other systems as well. Part of the reason that we're using um, a long-term research site rather than on-farm is it's very difficult to get reasonable N2O measurements on-farm. If you remember, there was we were measuring 22 to 34 times per year and each time we do that, it takes about a day in terms of field time and field prep. Uh, it would be very difficult to do on farm, and uh, that's that's really one of the primary reasons uh, to use a, a long-term study site for this. But you're, but in general, the question is 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 a good one in that one has to look at the specific management aspects of a given farming system to evaluate the global warming potential of that system. I hope that answers the question. OK, I'll move on to the next question. Um, in using the results to guide us in deciding which farming system would be best to mitigate climate change, you have to assume that you could implement these systems on all farmland. For the organic system, this is only true if the manure used to increase the carbon in the organic soil could be used on all fields. But the manure supply has limits, so is this a good assumption? We're not necessarily trying to uh, expand this to the entire uh, U.S. or whatever. What we're trying to understand is how current farming systems impact global warming. The manure questions are complicated. You've raised one of the uh, important ones is how much manure is available out there. Another question is how much of the carbon that we see increasing in our organic systems is due to manure and how much of it is due to um, the cover crops and the legume cover crops. And we don't know that for sure. Certainly a, a, a big portion of it is due to the manure. Um, we also have in these systems, we have a, in this uh, cropping systems trial, we have six year, a six year rotation, which includes three years of alfalfa. And the manure application rates are lower over, the six, over a six year period than in our three year system. But we have similar soil carbon in the two systems, which gives some evidence that um, that increases in soil carbon are not inherently the result of the manure application. Um, having said that, um, um, I kind of sorry I lost my train of thought. Okay. <laughs> All right. Um, before I move on to the next question, I just wanted to mention that we're going to be sending out a follow-up survey um, shortly after the webinar. So we really need your feedback, and we really value your feedback. So if you could answer that follow-up survey, that would be very helpful to us. Um, OK, next question. Organic farming usually requires more land to produce the same yield. Was this additional land use change factored into your study? Uh, that's why we looked at the greenhouse gas intensity measurement, which is dividing our global warming potential measurement by yield. Uh, that addresses the yield issue. It doesn't necessarily address the difference in land use. I want to emphasize, however, that the organic systems that we used here are based on kind of uh, state-of-the-art farmer knowledge and experience. And here at the Sustainable Agricultural Systems Lab, we think that the management of organic systems can be improved both in terms of using less manure, and that was what I was trying to allude to there a little bit with the increase in nitrogen mineralization that we see in our organic systems compared to our conventional systems. And there's uh, a lot of research going on here on reducing the amount of tillage within organic systems and uh, using cover crops and rolling them. And that is looking to be reasonably effective for soybean following a rye cover crop. There's still a fair amount of work that needs to be done for planting corn no-till within a legume cover crop. There's also more work that can be done to increase nitrogen use efficiency in all systems. And for the organic systems, we might be able to side-dress manure and 
apply it only in those years that we see that a PSNT, a preside less nitrate test, is low. And so we can reduce and target our um, manure applications. That's some of the types of research that we're doing here at the Sustainable Agricultural Systems Lab. And a lot of that has been driven by what we're learning in this long-term cropping systems trial. So I'm, we're not trying to say that this long-term cropping systems trial is kind of the way to farm organically or that it's the only way to farm organically. It's the way that we've chosen to do it based on um, our understanding of what farmers are doing in this area. And we're definitely not suggesting that uh, these systems are static. And we know that things are changing all the time, both in both in terms of management of the conventional systems, but also in terms of the organic systems. I do want to mention, though, that we are managing our conventional systems using best management practices, using a rye cover crop after corn, for example, and by uh, side dressing nitrogen in a band. So our organic, I mean, our conventional systems are probably, they, they reflect the knowledge gained from improving conventional systems largely through university and ARS research. But our organic systems reflect, uh, don't have the benefit of that amount of research. So I think those, they can definitely be improved. Okay. If legume cover crops were utilized in the no-till cropping system to reduce or eliminate conventional nitrogen fertilizer, couldn't no-till systems equal or exceed organic systems? Yeah, good question. We don't, we don't have those in our long-term system trial. We've talked about uh, making some changes to incorporate that kind of improved management, and that is quite possible, sure. Um, to the extent that nitrogen fertilizers are one of the dominant sources of CO2 emissions in uh, cropping systems, it makes a lot of sense to try to increase uh, biological nitrogen fixation in all cropping systems. And I think that's what some of this work in organic systems highlights is not just the benefit, not just how an organic system performs compared to a conventional system, but to learn from, to try to uh, blend the best of both worlds to try to develop systems that are even more sustainable. So sure, that's, uh, and that's another area that we're working on here at, uh, in Beltsville. Okay, we're we're getting a lot of comments about manure. Um, uh, <laughs> it's okay. Well, um, okay. Here's one, and I'll read you a couple of them so you can sort of comment on several different approaches to manure. Manure is well recognized for biological enhancement of soils. Is comparing with or organic with manure? Um, wait, hold on. Is comparing organic with manure to systems without manure equitable? Let me just read another couple of manure questions here. Um, manure is not the only way to include fertility. Um, and um, also there's a question that most organic grain farming in Montana use no manure and are just fine with perhaps some issue in phosphate deficiencies. So you comment some more on manure. Yeah. I think uh, the fact that we're getting a lot of questions on manure indicates how central manure is to many questions in agricultural sustainability in general, not, not just in organic farming. Uh, and uh, certainly in a place like Montana, there's certainly areas of the country where manures are not as available as they are here in the uh, in in the Mid-Atlantic region. We have a large chicken industry here, so when this project was established, the idea was to use local resources, and that's why the organic systems are manure-based. Uh, you might ask then why aren't the conventional systems manure based and that uh, is a good question. A little bit of a cop out answer in, from my perspective is that these uh, cropping systems were developed before I arrived here and I chose to keep that aspect uh, the same. However, there are um, a number of farmers in this area that use conventional systems that do use manure. So that, that is a good question. Um, we chose to manage these as uh, as they were established and to continue them that way. We have talked about, again, altering them to include some of the changes that people are suggesting, everything from reducing manure in the organic systems, increasing it in the conventional systems, and um, and changing rotations for that matter, or, or increasing 
uh, legume use in the uh, conventional systems. The challenge with any long-term project is that you don't want to be changing things constantly so that you can't make any long-term assessment of the type of management you're using. So there is kind of a constraint with long-term projects. At the same time, you don't want them to reflect management that's 50 years old. Well, we're not doing that at this point in, these, in this project, but if we kept doing this for 50 years, that is where we'd end up. So there's kind of a trade-off in a long-term system. And so that comes back to the type of question that someone asked earlier is why not measure these things on farm? And soil carbon can be measured on farm relatively easily, and the energy assessments can be made relatively easily. So again, the N2O, the nitrous oxide flux portion, is, is very difficult to do that way in terms of uh, labor and logistics. OK. Um, one listener asked, um, given your results, why isn't the USDA very actively promoting organic agriculture because of its many benefits, including climate change? Um, I'm a researcher. I'm not into, my job is not to promote anything other than my research results. Um, you would have to ask that question to someone with a higher level of authority than myself. I would add, though, that the in the last 20 years, the USDA has increased its research in organic systems quite a bit. Um, I would also point out that in the Sustainable Agricultural Systems Lab here at Beltsville, that we're in a constant dialogue with organic farmers, both locally and nationally, and with the organic uh, farming organizations, everybody from the Organic Farming Research Foundation uh, to some of the uh, sustainable agricultural organizations. Uh, I think that's as far as I can take that, 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 that question. OK. Um, here's another question. Aren't the carbon gains in the soil in organic largely a temporary event because each year CO2 is released as it breaks down and must be replaced by new cover crop and manure? In short, won't the carbon gains evaporate in a few years if the system is halted? Okay. Um, that's a really good question. We don't have a great sense of how long carbon stays in soil in different situations. You Remember from the depth um, the graph showing where the carbon is at depth in the core in the organic systems. We've been burying that carbon, uh, and we assume it's probably more stable than uh, carbon at the surface of the no-till system, for example. Um, when you say that it's uh, temporary, certainly you need to maintain. If we if we consider the soil carbon pool as a bank account again, you need to keep putting. You're always losing you're always making withdrawals and that CO2 is being emitted. So you do need to keep making um, uh, inputs into the soil to keep that carbon uh, at that level as you indicated. What we don't know, though, is at what level we need to be making those inputs. And the other thing is, as part of the organic management, we do focus on putting a lot of carbon into the soil each year. That's kind of one of the basic tenets of organic farming, whether we do it with cover crops or with uh, manure, the balance between those two certainly can be debated on what the best way to go is. However, we, uh, I'm not sure what, how much it makes sense to stop adding carbon why you would stop doing that. So I'm not positive what that, que how, what, what that means because it's an inherent part of that system is to, is to add the carbon. OK. Um, we had a couple questions about whether or not your study is published and available to the public. A portion of it is published at this point in the, um, yeah, I meant to put that on for future research. On uh, We can add it to the link on our website on the webinar page if you, yeah. if you send that to me, too. OK, mm -hmm. I could send that mm -hmm. to you. OK. Um, it's, at this point, it's published as a short paper focusing on the global warming potential aspects in a proceedings, in a uh, peer-reviewed proceedings from the Farming Systems Design Conference in 2009. And at this point, I'm working on uh, on finalizing the N2O portion from the corn fields, as well as the soil carbon part of it. So I'm a little behind on some of that. I appreciate the question, and I hope you look forward to, <laughs> to reading more about it. OK, yeah, like, I just wanted to repeat that we'll, whatever we get from Michelle, we will post it on the 
eOrganic webinar page, and you'll be able to find that on our website under Archived Webinars. And if you go to this webinar, then we'll post that information on this page. Um, let's see, here's some more questions. We have about 10 more minutes. Mm -hmm. Are there suggestions that you can make to improve the carbon efficiency of no-till? I think someone made the comment already, in, including more legume cover crops, makes a lot of sense to me in that you're replacing nitrogen fertilizers with um, biologically fixed nitrogen, which has a lower CO2 cost. However, it has more management costs. If we use these same rotations, we might not be able to, we wouldn't be able to plant the double crop soybean if we were using a uh, winter annual legume. Um, before the corn, so we you lose some of that um, cash crop portion of the of the of the rotation. Um, in terms of keeping more of the carbon in the soil, I mean, there's a lot of different things people are talking about, from biochar to adding manure as well in the no-till system. Problem with adding manure in a no-till system is that you really want to incorporate manure, so you don't have to deal with runoff issues. Um, so there are challenges there too. And every any time you make any of those changes in a no-till system, you, you have some ramifications in terms of the management of of uh, succeeding crops. Um, but certainly, there's probably ways of increasing the the carbon in the no-till beyond what we've done here. Um, however, including a, a a rye cover crop after the corn is where we've sought to do a good job there with keeping the soil covered uh, in a no-till system. Okay. How can or should these data be used to affect emerging agriculture policy? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I don't know if I can answer the should, but I can answer the uh, how we plan to use these data. One of the things that um, policy is probably going to have to be based on is some modeling approaches. And so what we want to do is to use these data from long-term cropping system like this to test the models that are being developed and possibly used. Things like for the N2O, we're, we're looking at the Descent model and the DNDC model. We'll be evaluating how well those models um, uh, predict the N2O flux that we can measure by hand. And my hypothesis on that is that the, the models will not be as good for the organic system as the conventional systems, just because there's not as much long-term data that went into those models to develop those models from organic systems as there are from conventional systems. So maybe I'll be proven wrong there, but that's my working hypothesis. Um, so long-term research projects have, have been crucial in identifying no-till as a superior method for carbon sequestration compared to conventional till. The fact that uh, no-till has really kind of uh, been highlighted as the star method for sequestering carbon is because there's a number of long-term projects to evaluate that. And there's been a fair amount of data published on that. Um, so long-term projects are pretty, pretty fundamental to uh, developing a better understanding upon which policy can be based. So that's by testing models is one way that we want to look at that. One thing I didn't include in this talk is that we used an existing model, which is um, the Russell 2 model that's used by NRCS to uh, actually to make conservation payments to farmers. And we ran that. I ran that with a, well, an NRCS person ran it for me using our data from the long-term project and using our soil carbon data. And it did not do a good job for the organic system. It did a pretty good job for the no-till and the chisel-till system. And that model, um, because that model is used uh, in policy, it is a concern that, that the model be better uh, able to predict the impact of manure additions, legume additions, et cetera. So we've already started that conversation with some of these data by uh, talking to NRCS and uh, seeing, and they, and they make they constantly make improvements in those models, and but without long-term data, they really can't. Okay. Um, next question: How does the soybean double crop fit in the calculations? This is the trade-off of organically fixed nitrogen from the vetch versus producing a crop at the same time. 
Right. Um, can you just repeat the question? Just so yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm trying to read it. Um, let's see. How does the soybean double crop fit in the calculations? This is the trade-off of organically fixed nitrogen from the vetch versus producing a crop at the same time. Um, I guess I, I I'm could, not I could exactly understand sure. that question yeah. two different mm -hmm. ways, but let me mm -hmm. try to answer it the way I understand it. Mm -hmm. is, um, the, uh, the, the energy cost of the soybeans are calculated the same way as they are with all the crops and as they are with the vetch. Um, but I think you were asking more specifically kind of for a quantitative answer. And off the top of my head, I probably can't give that quantitative answer of how much benefit you get from using the vetch versus the double crop soybean. Uh, that's an interesting question because that could lead you to using a, uh, the vetch in, say, the conventional systems as we are managing them. Um, so that's... I, I probably can't answer that question off the top of my head. Very okay. Well. Um, let's see. Um, thank you for doing this research. Uh, one viewer said, "How can you? How can we do more of this in all areas of the nation?" Oh, well, that's a good question. Um, well, here's my understanding of how uh, ALS research works in in kind of the macro scale. The more interest is shown by the public as a whole or by specific interest groups in a particular research topic, the more USDA responds to that. Um, the fact that I can do organic research in USDA reflects the fact that there's a growing market in organic grains and is largely driven by consumer preference for organic materials, is my understanding. Um, a, 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 a I guess I could also point you to the Organic Farming Research Foundation that could give you their perspective, for example, on um, developing more organic research, if that's what you're asking. In terms of having more long-term projects in general, whether they have organic or not, uh, that's, a, that's a tougher challenge. Um, my understanding is uh, that uh, if you have local people that see the value of that and are willing to uh, understand the challenges that it en encompasses and take on the challenge, uh, then it can happen. Okay. Um, we're running out of time, but I wanted to mention that um, several listeners wrote about no-till organic production work um, going on in vegetable production at Cornell. So um, one wanted to know if you had looked at that. Um, no, I have not specifically looked at vegetable production at Cornell. Okay. Uh, I'm not positive of that study, and I'm sure that the people that did that study uh, I, I <laughs> would like me to. I yes, okay. <laughs> I, uh, I'm, I'm not positive. Okay, yeah, I just wanted to refer to that for people who might be interested. Um, we're running out of time, but I'd like to thank you all for your questions. As I mentioned before, if you have additional questions that weren't answered in the webinar, you can use the e-extension Ask an Expert service, and the address for that is on your screen. Um, the webinar will also be posted on the eOrganic website within the next seven days at www.extension.org slash organic underscore production under archived webinars. I've got the address displayed on the screen. We'd also very much appreciate it if you could fill, up our, fill out our follow-up email survey, which you'll shortly be receiving in an email. So thank you so much for joining us again, Michelle, and thank you all for joining us. Thank you all for attending.